friend of mine down in the Keys had a painting on his wall and I asked him, I was like, man, where is that? I've got to go. And he said, in Colorado, in the Rockies, right next to Aspen. The whole reason we were so excited to come to Aspen was because of the maroon bells. Which are not in this shot. Which are not in this shot. <laughs> You'll have to stay tuned to find out what the maroon bells are if you don't already know. Finally made it to Aspen. Join us in today's episode as we go hunt down the maroon bells. Wherever I go, I will always know everything I need is right here with me. It's time to let it all go, no matter who knows anything about me now. I'm ready to see what love's got for me. I got one thing left to say. Nestled in the heart of the White River National Forest and surrounded by the peaks of the Elk Mountains, Aspen is well known as a ski destination, but the town's history and offerings go much deeper. Around every corner lies beautiful architecture, fine shops, restaurants, and lodges. Aspen's most popular summertime activities include biking, hiking, horseback riding, fishing, and backcountry camping. We finally made it to Aspen and we are at the Silver Creek Campground. It's kind of a first come first serve right now. We've got a tent campsite, so we are parked in the parking spot and we're just gonna sleep there tonight. It's only $15 a night, no hookups, no water, nothing. There is a pit toilet bathroom, but that's it. We will be here for a few days and we'll bring you guys along with all of our adventures. seem to have stumbled upon a paragliding runway of some sort. It's like their little zen spot to land or take off or whatever they're doing over here. There's a community garden over there, so let's go check that out. Oh wow, this is the biggest community garden I've ever seen. Look at that, it's beautiful. So one of the things I miss most about being on the road is being able to garden and grow my own foods. So it's great when we find a like, community garden that would allow us to harvest. Unfortunately at this one, as a visitor, we're only allowed to walk through. They have such a short grow season in Colorado, but it grows fast because they have so much water. Things grow. Incredibly well. These things are beautiful. What is that, like purple kale? So how community gardens work is typically you pay an annual fee and you get your own little plot of land to grow whatever you want and then you just maintain your own plot. Oh, those are pretty. Oh, it's so pretty. So much color. Colorado has so much color compared to other states in the summer. Everything is just brown. <laughs> He's a moth the size of a hummingbird. I don't know why I find her so pretty. There's a big cabbage. So, lots of greenery, lots of flowers, a snake and a chipmunk.
그릇. He walks in quiet solitude, the forest and the streams, seeking grace in every step he takes. His sights have turned inside himself to try and understand the serenity of a clear blue mountain lake and the Colorado Rocky Mountain High. I've seen it raining fire in the sky. Talk to God and listen to the casual reply. the John Denver Sanctuary. It's a really cool rock garden next to a stream and they've got all of his song lyrics etched into these large boulders that they've broken in half. It's a really neat sanctuary. I like the rock garden. Beautiful. All these neat little trails and pathways along the river and through the rocks and around the park. I highly recommend checking this out if you guys come here. It's a nice little peaceful area to take a break. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you would, please click the like button, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, click the little bell, it'll give you a reminder when Tuesday's episode comes out. Thanks for watching. This is the building we're standing in. This is one of three buildings that are still standing from this gigantic silver processing complex that was built in 1891. It had one single goal, to process very, very low quality silver ore and still be able to make a profit. Now, almost all of Aspen's ore is of, of a very high quality. 
Quality refers simply to the number of ounces of silver you get in a ton of rock. And in this main plant here, this big building, it had big settling tanks in the longer portion here. They would uh, precipitate out a lot of the silver ore. The mines in Aspen would routinely come out with 300, 500, 1,000, 1,500 ounces a ton. And that's what Aspen was really famous for, the incredible high quality of its silver ore. In fact, the 227 mines were producing one-sixth of all the silver in the United States. That's one sixteenth of all the silver in the whole world. Now, when the silver crash came in 1893, the government was basically buying all of the silver that was being mined in the United States. The silver crash was uh, pretty devastating to Aspen. So this map is pretty cool because it shows you where the silver is. It's bound up in this pink stripe that goes directly across the valley. This pink is a quartzite crystal and has lots of silver in it. The silver also migrates into the dark green shale right next to the pink. Silver nuggets do not form very readily in nature. And when they do, they only form deep underground under very specific conditions. Conditions that we do have right here in abundance. If you go hundreds and thousands of feet below us right now, you will find geothermically heated water streaming through the rock. Since it's underground and since it's under tremendous pressure, it doesn't have the opportunity to expand out into steam. So it superheats until it's literally hotter than the melting point of silver. As it flows through the rock, the silver will melt and flow along with this water. Once the water gets into the pockets and cracks, it starts to slow down and cool. The silver will condense. It forms little nuggets called native silver. Or when it forms in cracks, it makes what's called wire silver. This really slinky wiry shape. The Smuggler Mine and the Molly Gibson Mine right, right next to it in the 1890s were the two largest silver mines in the world. This is our miniature assayer's office. The purpose of this one building was to generate a four ounce sample from every train car lord of ore that pulls up. The uh, four ounce sample is put into those ceramic cups which are then put into the kiln, this oven. A lot of the material you don't want is literally burned off. The silver itself is going to make a bead at the bowls of the bottom of the cup. The bead is then weighed on those super accurate balances, and that determines the percentage of silver that was in the, uh, the shipment of, of silver ore. Silver doesn't really become shiny and pretty like we think of silver as being until you refine it up past 99% purity. Doesn't look like much to us, does it? Very, very dull, gray, ugly rocks. But a good prospector could hike up Aspen Mountain, say in the year 1885, pick up a rock like this right off the ground, and just from his knowledge and experience be able to think, ooh, I can get a thousand ounces a ton out of this. Better stake a claim. Now to get the silver out of the silver ore, the first step is to pulverize it. And this is the machine with which you do it. This is called a stamp mill. Early 20th century, the prices of silver are starting to creep back up as the film industry is increasing the need for silver. You have to process silver for your film and for your brownie cameras. Mr. David Hyman, the primary owner of the Smuggler Mine, wants to reopen the lower levels. So he knows there's some nice, fat, juicy veins of silver down there. But there's a bit of a problem. The pumps to pump the water out of those mines haven't been operated for over 20 years, and they're under 100 feet of water deep down in the bottom of a mine. So what do you do? There's no underwater lighting technology. King decided he'd hire two deep sea divers, and basically they were blindfolded and trained to unclog the pumps, repack the grease and the bearings, and to do minor repair work that was needed all just using their sense of touch. Those two divers could only work 40 minutes at a time. The meltwater from the snow falling through the mountain was so freezing cold, it sucked the energy out of them. Uh, this safe features our collection of early 21st century cleaning products. It's taken a while to accumulate it, but we're pretty proud of what we've done. This is one of five working steam engines we have on the property. This is the one of the two I'm able to run. So the steam comes in through this tube right in here. Before the steam gets into the steam engine, it has to pass through a cutoff valve that's inside this ball here. This cutoff valve cuts off the flow of steam into the engine, sending more and more of the steam directly out the exhaust without routing it through the piston and cylinder and providing power. The valve is activated by this device up here called the governor. If you have these two weighted balls on these leaf springs, and as the machine is operating, this thing is spinning around. The faster the machine is operating, the faster these balls spin, and the more centripetal action pulls them out. If you've ever been going balls out, or going balls to the walls, those expressions come from this device here. You're going as fast as you possibly can. That's where you get this expression. Now we just turn a couple valves, and everything should start moving. There we go.
Now that stamping was not actually going to do any stamping. We have it set to it bumps one of the hammers just a couple, just an inch or so. If that machine was actually running full blast, it would shake the entire building apart in a matter of minutes. Hi guys, today we're hiking Maroon Bells Trail. As you can see behind me, we're at the iconic Maroon Bells. It's one of the most photographed mountain peaks in all of the world. The lower lake here is called Maroon Lake. And if you're not a hiker, you can buy a bus ticket to actually, it'll drop you off right here by this lake. So you can still see the beautiful iconic peaks and the views that are in all the photos. But if you're more, outgoing and you want to hike we're doing a 3.6 mile round trip up past crater lake which is 1.4 miles from the marine lake so that's what we're taking you on today Shore is a pretty hike. It's really green and lush. Also really rocky, so watch your toes. Good girl. She's so funny. So I'm waiting for you to film me. Oh wow. Oh, it's not even a trail anymore. I'm gonna call this Ankle Breaker Rally. Welcome to the Maroon Bells. We made it. I'm super stoked. I saw this place on a painting on a friend's wall in the Florida Keys six months ago and decided I needed to go there because this is gorgeous. And uh, let me tell you, that painting was really something. But this, seeing it in person, just doesn't do it justice. This is absolutely incredible. We are surrounded by gorgeous peaks right now. So we got the, the Maroon Bells, the, the one closest to us is the North Peak, and then the one behind us is the South Peak. You can't see it from here because this peak's in the way. Pyramid is on the other side of this peak, and we're gonna hike over there 
and try to get a glimpse in a minute. This here is Crater Lake. <laughs> this is this is the spot. <laughs> this is pretty cool. I would compare this to Yosemite. This is absolutely fantastic. It's like standing in the valley of Yosemite and looking up around. Except in the valley of Yosemite, you got cars all around you. Here, you just have foot traffic. The the foot traffic's not even that bad. This is really nice. It's super quiet. You can hear the wind in the trees. Still snow up there. I don't know if you guys can see that on the screen, but we're at the end of August, still snow up there. From here, you can do an 11 mile hike all the way to Crested Butte, which if we were to drive to Crested Butte, it would take us two and a half hours because you got to go all the way around these mountains. I think that's pyramid. This is Pyramid Peak over here. Uh, you can kind of just see one edge of it. I think that whole edge is Pyramid Peak. I'm not exactly sure. I'm gonna give you guys the lowdown, the know before you go. When you come to the Maroon Bells, there is a few camping spots back here. So if you have a reservation, there's a few first come first serves. You have a campsite. You can come to the Maroon Bells, you can drive up to the parking lot anytime that they're open. If you do not, you do have to take a bus tour up here from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Those tickets were roughly $30, but it's a sightseeing tour as well, so they'll give you a lot of information. If you're unable to hike, they'll drop you off at Maroon Lake down at the bottom. You can still see the bells from there. It's still a really pretty view. It's the iconic photo you will see if you Google Maroon Bells. I still recommend coming here at least once in your life. If you can do the hike, I would say it's moderate to strenuous, just based on the, the rocky, loose footing and elevation gain, but it's totally worth it. And when you come out here, you can also see the, the pyramid peak. The maroon bells themselves are both 14ers. That means they're both over 14,000 feet. And if you are an extremist, you can hike up to the top of those peaks. Beautiful, beautiful, highly recommend it. something you've done a thousand times in your life. And, right. You know, you just don't think about it. <laughs> this side, you got a little awesome. bend in there. Yeah. A little scratch, a little bend. Catch sunrise. It's a cold one. Yeah, it's like 38 degrees outside right now. Good morning. As you can probably see behind me, the maroon bells are starting to turn maroon while the sun's coming up, which is how they get their names. So you got the, the north peak here on the front and the south peak right behind it. They're shaped like bells and during certain times of the day, they turn a maroon color. So 
So we hope you guys enjoy. We've got a time lapse for you. Okay, we've been out here about an hour now and it's still freezing. The sun has come up, as you can see. The bells are almost in full sun. So I think we're about to wrap up and get to doing something else today. Thanks for joining us. Hi, baby. What is you eating? Two? He's got a whole family of mice. Super cute. We just saw a fox with three or four mice in its mouth. If you like today's episode, show your support. Hit that like, subscribe, and ring the little bell for us. And we'll see you next Tuesday on our next adventure. Where are we going next week? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know where we're going next. We never know. We're, we, we've got some general guidelines, but uh, I think we're staying. Is, we have no idea where we're going. We're staying in Colorado, right? Maybe. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe. You just have to watch to find out. Yeah. Tune in on Tuesday. Next Tuesday. We'll find out together. It'll be fun, I promise you that. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs>